Hey everyone, and thank you for tuning in to another episode of In Studio. Today we have a special guest, Paul Sparks. Hi. How are you today? Good. Thanks I'm for good. coming in. Yeah. Did you uh, have a nice long weekend? Were uh, you able to enjoy it at all? Or? Uh, it, was, it was okay. I was in New York. It was, um, it was really, really cold. And then I, um, and I'm rehearsing a play, and so I was doing that. And uh, then I flew out here for, you know, TCAs. For Waco. For Waco. To talk all things Waco. Now you're here to talk about Waco, but you've been in quite a lot recently. House of Cards, The Crown, The Greatest Showman, and the upcoming Sweep It Air. Right. Out of all those roles, I guess, which has stood out to you the most and why? Out of, like, your recent roles. Huh. Which stood out to me? I don't know. I, I mean, it's hard to, it's sort of hard to, to yeah. delineate. I mean, I think, I think actually Waco has been a really interesting one. It was probably the one I had the most to do in. Yeah. Uh, it was, it was, it caught, I had to relocate to, you know, San, uh, Santa Fe for, for a few months. And uh, so it was just the kind of the most profound impact on yeah. my life was probably working on it. Um, but, you know. They've all they've they've all taken Touched a little pe- taken a little piece of me. That's great. Yeah. Uh no. Before we just started, I was telling you I didn't know too much about David Koresh and the story of right. Waco. Um, because you were very small. Yeah, I, I guess I was pretty small. What? How much did you know about it before signing on? And did you learn anything else? Sure. Well, there? I was from I'm from Oklahoma. Yeah. And so, uh, which you know is we're right down the block from from Waco and so I was very aware of kind of the goings on but I feel like the 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 narrative that was sort of put out there by the um the PR machine you know like what sold newspapers yeah. kind of painted a picture of David Koresh this complete lunatic and these kind of sexual deviant weirdos you know all in this house that and of course you know when uh you take a closer look uh, as we did the, we found that you know they they were really just it was a bunch of people you know who were complicated and nuanced and maybe had a little bit of some ideas that were a little bit outside the norm uh, in terms of their religiosity and whatnot. But they, you know, they were a community, yep. and uh, but if you combine a sort of isolated community, some rumors about. Uh, maybe some cultish type things going on, and then you can find you know a lot of weapons which they had because they bought. That's how they supported yeah. uh, themselves was buying and selling uh, weapons at gun shows. It just tur- it turned into a real mess that that situation. So it was good, but we were we were lucky. I took it because there was they're based on two different books. No. It was based on a book by David Thibodeau, who was one of the survivors. And it was also based on Gary Nesner's book, who was uh, the head negotiator for the FBI. And these guys, I don't know that they necessarily totally agree yeah. on like what went down. However, they, they were both interested in discussing the complexity and the nuance of like humanity on both sides. Both sides. And uh, the Dowdle brothers who wrote the script were also really interested in that. It's funny, I would like to know what happened on the other side with Mike Shannon and those guys that were doing the FBI guys, because yeah. I was in the Davidian yeah. side, and we were this little community, and we kind of shot all our stuff together, and then they shot all their stuff together. Um, so, but I, I, it was a, it was a really uh, interesting project. Going off of what you um, just talked about, the series, the tone of the series, it doesn't, set the Davidians up as, I guess, sympathetic characters, per se, but it doesn't paint them in the picture that kind of people going into it may have thought no. of them as. Can you kind of talk about setting up that tone and how audiences get to kind of see it and learn about them through this investigation and through this story? Well, I think that the thing that's been lost in this story, uh, and considering it's probably one of the largest tragedies that's happened, yeah. you know, certainly with our government involved, in actually, you know, uh, being a part of like so many deaths on American soil, it's like a, it's such a big part of our history that kind of just got glossed over, I think. And um, 
there were some really bad decisions that were made, it yeah. seems like, in terms of the ATF and also the FBI, and then there were some bad decisions that were made by David Koresh and yeah. his people. But, you know, they were trying to figure out a way to, like, make this work, and they were just a community. You know, they were they were a community that had, you know, sort of rules and ideas about the way things ought to be, and... Uh, no one kind of bothered to understand what it was that they were trying to do. And I think that, you know, that miscommunication sort of led to this. So hopefully you'll see that. You'll see them trying to work that out between each other and how hard it was. Now, in terms of uh, your character, Steven Schneider's relationship with David Koresh, um, Rory Culkin's character points out that you guys are best friends and, and your reaction to that is on some days. Can you kind of talk about <laughs> that dynamic? and Right. Well, David and Steve Schneider were, were they, they met, um, Steve Schneider was a theologian, he was in Hawaii at yeah. the time, and he uh, was sort of introduced to David through um, some audio tapes that he heard David talking yeah. about his stuff, and he was a Seventh-day Adventist, which is a sort of re- revelations, uh, heavy, sort of yeah. second coming, heavy uh, religion, and he'd never heard anything quite like David, and they started out with a kind of an antagonistic relationship where he was really questioning David, but uh, David was a really fascinating guy. He, you know, he'd memorized the Bible. He, he, he knew scripture in a way, and somehow he spoke to Steve, and they became really uh, good friends. And I think once they started uh, together, it really was like this sort of mission that they were both on. And uh, but, you know, David was also impulsive and, and, and kind of cruel and manipulative, and he had a way that was very testing, and uh, Steve being the sort of subordinate person that he was, uh, I think it was very love-hate with him. You know, he yeah. left a lot. You know, he would leave and yeah. come back, and he would get sent away and come back, but he was always sort of recruiting people. Um, and I think that it, the evidence... It looks like you know that these guys loved each other, but it was you know it was it was really complicated. And plus, he you know he had a child with Steve Schneider's wife. Going off that, <laughs> um, <laughs> that was pretty it's heartbreaking. Bummer, and, yeah. and I feel like Schneider is kind of a way in to to show the lives of these characters and, and mm-hmm. these these real emotions and what they were facing. Um, I guess, what was your react? Did you know as much about Schneider as you did about David Crush? No, Schneider no. In him? fact, I didn't even know that there was a Steve Schneider. Okay. You know, I'd never heard, I'd never heard his name before. Uh, but we were really lucky. You know, we had David Thibodeau on set, who knew Steve, yeah. obviously. Um, and Gary Nesner was on set, who negotiated a lot with him. Yeah. And I got in touch with uh, uh, his sister, uh, Sue, who's very gracious and talked to me about Steve and the kind of person that he was. And I just sort of picked at things and read some books. Um, there's a book by Mark Bro, which was another guy. He was kind of the guy that introduced them um, that had some information. And uh, I just sort of compiled what I talked to even Dick DeGarren, who is the lawyer yeah. um, for those guys. And I, you know, I found out a lot about him in that way that what a sort of congenial um, kind of fiery, um, funny, happy-go-lucky guy that he was, yeah. Um, now, one thing I love about this show is it is based on true events, and, and I love shows like this. Mm-hmm. For some viewers, I mean, hopefully most people know about these events, but spoiler alert, if not, um, right. the FBI alleged that Schneider was the one to kill David Crush. Yeah, there's there's a lot of... They don't know exactly what happened. You know, they sort yeah. of had to kind of mop through the the uh, the ashes after it was over, and uh, they found uh, they found bullet wounds in both yeah. David and in Steve Schneider, and um, there is some conjecture that that perhaps uh, that's what happened. Um, but there's there, no way. They, they, it's hard to know. You know, yeah. it's not like anybody was that is still around that was in there. So I mean, this is a tough question, but what do you think? I guess. Um, well, we we sort of we made a decision in the in the show, and so I won't I won't spoil it with what I think. Okay. I, because I do I think that, but but uh, it's it's uh, I was I was surprised I was surprised by the time we we worked pretty much in order uh, when we were filming it, and um, I was surprised like the sort of 
why the whys and the wherefores of what ended up happening I thought were were surprising. No. Yeah. With the subject matter being that pretty heavy, were you guys able to keep it light on set at all? Any fun moments that stood up for you? Yeah, I mean, it was a, it was. If you guys fun. are all together in Texas. Yeah. Uh, or we were actually in Santa Fe. Santa Fe um, but uh, yeah, it was. I mean, I think a little bit we looked to uh, David Thibodeau to sort of gain some sort of permission to to make light at times no. of things. But you know, we were a real community. Even our it was the same background every day. Everybody knew each other. We, um, you know we became a little family and so there was bound to be humor and uh you know taylor kitch is awesome and hilarious and canadian and um he's just he's so funny and uh we were all able to kind of come out of come out of the darkness of it at times and and have a laugh so it was a it was a love fest yeah working on it now uh you were part of uh the night of which was a limited series and this is kind of dubbed as a six part limited series do you as an actor do you like doing limited series or i do i you know i think this i think this sort of new way of of telling stories a little bit more long form it's it's very uh actor satisfying i think sometimes in movies it's audience satisfying it, well, yeah, yeah well i think it is i you know i think sometimes in movies uh, though I totally understand the art of trying to tell a story in a couple of hours, no. there there's something more uh, delicious about working on something for six hours or or ten. You know that uh, you can really suss out and sort of take your time and um, do a lot more character development and things like no. that. So for me, it's a it's a much better process. But you know, I kind of take jobs when I can get them. That's good. <laughs> um, now, you're also recently the author of a bombshell book called Fire and Fury. Yeah, right. <laughs> yes. Your character in House of Cards was writing a book um, mm -hmm. about the White House. Mm -hmm. What was your reaction to the book that actually came out about the Trump White House recently? Well, I haven't read it, so I don't, you know, no. I, don't, I don't really know. I've just sort of heard the, the bits and pieces from yeah. the world when um, uh, I did see, a, I saw a little bit of the Saturday Night Live sketch. That's great. Um, but, this but uh I pfft. I mean did you relate the two at all or am I just being crazy? No, I see <laughs> I see I see the relation. The you problem. know, there's yeah. like a person who's involved on the inside and who had and who had access and and knew some things and uh I mean it's hard to imagine that uh all the things that I've heard are true, but then again maybe they are true. No. You know, I I don't know. To me, to me, that side of like what is happening in our political discourse is ultimately. Uh, I know it's salacious and it's really fun to talk about in the media. Yeah, but it's not. And they and they spend you know twenty four hours a day, seven days a week, right. like every channel from Fox to MSNBC talking about it. But um, ultimately, you know, my hope is that at some point it comes back to like being sort of boring policy. Yeah that we just kind of talk about policy because I think that that's, you know, uh, ultimately what's, what's the most important. This other stuff is just theater, you know. Definitely. No, it's, it's really true. But I guess it's good theater. So, yes, I, I do. I, I totally get it. Um, but mine is, I was on a TV show. Yeah, exactly. And this is, this is real, our real lives. Um, <laughs> now, spoiler alert, your character, the way that your character's story ended last season, mm. it won't be in, uh, he won't be in the final season. No, at least that we know I, of. At least, unless, unless as as a a, a ghost, wandering, <laughs> well, want, still wandering around in the. Well, in the to White haunt House. the president now, uh, Claire Underwood. Right, right. Um, on a more serious note, though, uh, given the sexual assault allegations against Kevin Spacey, the show is carrying on without yeah. him. Mm -hmm. How do you kind of see the show going on without him? And you worked closely with Robin Wright. And sure, uh, you know. I, I don't know. It's not like I have necessarily have a real direct conduit to no. what's what's going on there. I, I I don't. I mean, I know Melissa Gibson and uh, Frank, yeah. who are the showrunners, and um, from your theater days, right? From my theater days, and I I'm I'm certain that they're you know figuring out the right way to sort of handle yeah. this, and uh, they're all in very good hands with Robin. She's a she's a pro, and she's amazing, and. No. Um, they're lucky to have, you know, someone there. I can only imagine how sort of disrupting it's all been. But this is the necessary 
the necessary uh, part of yeah. change. I think to, sometimes yeah. I think this is this is how it goes. And so I'm happy for the crew, and I'm happy for the people that sort of haven't had a job for a while. You yeah. know that they'll be going back to work. Going back to work. I just look forward. I look forward to seeing it. I'm I'm curious as as everybody else. Awesome. Uh, now another thing a lot of people are talking about is your upcoming role in Sweet Bitter. Mm. Can you kind of talk about that and yeah. what drew you to it? I guess so. Yeah, I read Stephanie Danler's book, Sweet Bitter, which uh, she was uh, a waiter in, in a Union Square Cafe. Yep. Uh, kind of, I think this is sort of, it's sort of a period piece. It's sort of based around pre-cell phone, like pre, I mean pre-iPhone, like 2006. Which I think most things should be. Right, right. It's so much more interesting. <laughs> it's so way more. It's so much more interesting. So it's, it's sort of a period piece of 2006. Uh, but... Uh, it's kind of about a young girl who uh, sort of comes of age through the restaurant business, and yeah. it's this kind of fancy restaurant business. I remember I, I was going to school at NYU. I mean, it was 10 years earlier, but, you know, just the, the you know, to me, that particular vibe of this sort of Union Square, like, that area in the 20s and uh, teens up there right in the, uh, like, around Fifth Avenue. To me, that is such a specific um, thing, and I feel like Stephanie really wrote to that. She totally got it. It was a very, I don't like the word authentic, but it was a really authentic sort of look at that. I was really interested, and then when I found out she was on the uh, writing staff, that she was going to be there, um, I got really interested in, in doing it. It's a good part. I play the manager of the thing, and he's sort of a peacock and <laughs> kind of a funny. He's a funny guy um, who's got his, got some problems. And, uh, yeah, Elle Purnell, she's a star, you know. Yeah. She's, 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 she's amazing. And, and it's a bunch of young actors um, that uh, I'm kind of grandpa on that set. <laughs> Which is, you know, hard for me to take. <laughs> I used to be the kid. You yeah, know, I'm you're not grandpa. I'm, I'm, you're oh, all... I'm grandpa on that show. Um, they don't remember Waco either. <laughs> um, La last question. Your co-star Taylor Kitsch is coming by later today. Oh, good. Do you have any fun questions for him or anything you want to know, I guess, from him about his portrayal of Dare Crash? Or... Um... Any fun questions? Uh, I want to know how much weight he lost. Uh, I want to know how much weight he gained from the time that he got to. Like, if he, he told me that I think he may have gained a little weight while he was down in Santa Fe. No. He wasn't supposed to. He's supposed oh, to be really? skinnier. So I want to know how much weight he gained while he was down there. Um, I want to know if he likes Canada better than uh, the United States. Uh, even though I know he lives in Texas. Um, I want to know if you can show him a picture of what I'm wearing because it looks like I, I like, coach for the for the Texas Longhorns, which is a, it's true. It's a, it's so sad because I'm from Oklahoma and an Oklahoma Sooners fan. Yeah. If this makes him happy. Okay. I'll, I'll try so I ask him all those questions. Awesome. Uh, Waco premieres on the Paramount, Paramount Network. January 24th, what do you want to say to fans before we go? Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for being fans. Fans are, fans are good. Fans are good. Thanks for watching. All right.